Uh, let's go to the phone now to speak to one of my favorite guests. Here she is, Catherine Austin Fitz. Catherine, welcome back. Oh, it's great to be back. Well, I'm happy to have you back. Uh, you know, rather than try to set the agenda myself here, I'd be curious to hear you uh, talk about what the biggest thing is on your radar right now. Where are we in the in the process of, of economic collapse in America now? Well, I don't think we're in the middle of economic collapse at all. <laughs> yeah, you say it. You say it's a slow burn. Well, I think I think we're watching an economy that's being re-engineered, and I think that means for for many people in the middle class, it feels like a collapse because for them, it is a collapse. I see. So, so what I I think a lot of times when you use the word collapse, people imagine all of industrialized society sort of going down at the same time together. And, you know, so the tight, you know, we're all on the Titanic and, and the Titanic sinks and that's it. But if you look, in fact, globally, what's been happening is we've been watching a re-engineering, which involves very selective and targeted, and I would say intentional collapse, but in a sequ- sequential way. So, you know, since we, um, implemented the WTO in 1995, you know, at any given time, you know, two to 5% of the world economy is being targeted for a selective collapse. That's very, very profitable for the people who are doing the engineer engineering. But, um, but, you know, the, the world is not collapsing together at one time. So let's name names. So, who are these people who are, who are engineering these things? <laughs> well, don't you wish I had a list? Yeah. Um, you know, if if you look at our current economy, it's very politically managed and it's much more centralized than people believe. You know, there really is a matrix. At the same time, because it's decentralized, Jay, um, the implementation requires millions and millions of people. And so in one in one sense of the word, it's us. We're doing this. So, for example, let's look at the targeted collapse of Russia during the the 90s. So one of the first hit hardest after the the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed, the Americans sent in a lot of, you know, American intelligence agencies, law firms, you know, hedge funds, academics, and, you know, sort of forced a privatization scheme on Russia that literally collapsed the economy. You ended up with, you know, massive amounts of people. Uh, living under poverty at the end of the decade has started in in the beginning and and literally uh, you know significant depopulation so it really was sort of financial economic warfare um, you know so if you if you look at that kind of phenomena um, it was one that was very profitable for America a lot of money through the IMF deals and and the collapse of the banks got laundered back here is what it appears. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, if you look at the average person's 401k and IRA, a lot of people made money on that and were perfectly happy to do so. Now they can say that they don't understand, but um, I think what it's really important to understand is that we're looking at a global investment model. I call it the central banking warfare model. And frankly, we've all been making money on going along with it for years and years and years. And it's only recently that it's kind of turned on the baby boomers in the first world. And so, you know, now that we've gone from making money on it to suffering from it, we're saying, oh, I'm shocked, shocked. Who's to blame? (laughs) I see. So it's blowing up in our faces. Uh Well, it's blowing up in in the middle class space. And and let let me talk with respect to the American middle class. We, you know, for many years we were the beneficiary of the central banking warfare model, and one of the reasons was we were financing it. In other words, we were working hard and putting money in our 401ks and our IRAs and our pension funds and, and basically putting money into the social security fund, which was turning around and financing the, you know, the, the military portion of the central banking warfare model. So, so we're cash flow plus to the military industrial complex. And what happened in the mid nineties when we instituted the WTO and adopted the Uruguay round of GATT is a decision was made to suck out that capital and shift it into investment elsewhere, whether in the merging markets or space. And in the meantime, uh, you know, we didn't notice we were having too much fun in the housing bubble and the, and the tech bubble and the internet stock bubble. 
And then when the bubble was over, what we discovered was, oh, that capital had been taken. And now that we were ready to retire and wanted to be net cash flow minus to the military industrial complex, the military industrial complex said, ah, you know, (laughs) guess what? We're going to cut the teacher's benefits and the public employee's benefits and your 401k and IRA has dropped 50 percent. And maybe we need to raise taxes. And now the president's saying Social Security and Medicare on the on the chopping block and you know, basically what they're saying is now that we've got your money, we're going to change the deal. So, so the boomers are being switch hit, but until they were switch hit, they were happy to go along. Interesting. I, I, I see what you mean. And so does that mean that this just has to play out because there is this, uh, I don't know, this, this, this sense of, you know, people don't even know what's going on or why they created it. So does this just have to play out before it changes? Well, let's look at the budget deal because a lot of this is going to play out in the federal budget deal. Um, okay. We now have the federal budget basically um, going through two critical decision points. One is the what to do on the increase in the debt ceiling limit, and sort of the debate between Congress and the different parts of Congress and the the White House on how you're going to achieve that. And then, of course, we have a new budget coming up. Uh, The 2012 budget goes into effect on October 1st. So the appropriations bills have to be reconciled and and finally voted out by the end of September. So we have two big decision points on the budget. And I suspect that the package on both, you know, the decisions will be made as a package together and has to be done by August 5th when the government, uh, when the Congress recesses for the summer and, uh, or takes their summer vacation. So, um, you know, we kind of have between now and then, and, and a lot of these issues are going to come up and here's what's going to come up. You're going to have everyone saying there's no money, there's no money. So we either have to raise taxes or cut expenditures or a combination of both. And another group of people, such as myself, saying, wait a minute, (laughs) we have $4 trillion missing from the federal accounts. Depending on who you talk to, we have 12 to $27 trillion extended or given to the banks as a gift. That totals, you know, 12 plus 4 trillion is 16 trillion. That's more than the total outstanding debt of the country. This is not... Uh, you know, a fiscal crisis, this is a political crisis because we're having a financial coup d'etat. In other words, if you can steal money every year and then say, oh, well, our problem is we have no money. No, our problem is not that we have no money and we're not living financially responsible. The problem is you're stealing. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what it comes so, down know. to. This is a criminal enterprise that needs to be shut down. Well, I, I would be careful how I say that. So, so First of all, if you look at every – because America just breaks down to 3,100 counties, okay? Right. Um, if you look at our our finances one county at a time, the primary source of income county after county in all 3,100 counties is the federal government. So we've so central – I mean the Soviet Union in 89 had nothing on us other than, you know, yes, their their housing stock was public. But at this point, given, you know, who owns the banks and the banks own the housing stock, right. you know, it could be argued that ours is not that much different. So, so we have a highly socialized economy from a financial standpoint, and you have a significant number of people dependent on the federal government. So, so if tomorrow we said, okay, we're not going to, you know, we're going to shut down treasuries, um, then you're talking about a collapse in every county, county by county, of the of the economy. Number one and number two, um, you're talking about a collapse of many stock portfolios because if you take, um, you know, by day I'm an investment advisor and and oftentimes I'll see people come into me and I'll look at their portfolio and they have hundreds of different stocks and bonds when you look through all the mutual funds and it looks like they're very diversified but in fact they're not because if you trace back all those stocks and bonds they're completely dependent on defense contracts government federal government purchases or purchases coming out of state and local government funded from the federal government and so you know the dependency here Mm. is extraordinarily deep and I think it's important to appreciate that what we've been doing for, for a long time is we've been selling treasuries globally, and then the value of those treasuries go down as we debase the dollar. And that debasement is accelerating with QE1, 2, and now probably a QE3. 
and 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 that debasement of an asset on their balance sheets is a global taxation system and that global taxation system has been financing a way of life here um, you know, we've all been living above our means. Now, you can argue, do we want to cut the black budget or do we want to cut Social Security? But here's the politics of it, Jay. Mm-hmm. If you look at this budget deal we're talking about, whether it's on the debt ceiling or the fiscal 2012 budget, you've got three pots. You've got the baby boomers' entitlements, and they're not really entitlements. I mean, we've been putting money into Social Security, et cetera. So, so the baby boomer promises versus the military versus the interest on the government debt. So you've got three pots. Well, if you stop paying interest on the government debt, then you know you freeze up the treasury market and the whole game stops. If you stop paying the military, then the military can't run around the world and force everybody to take the treasury. So the global taxation system stops and the game stops. But if you cut the boomers, if you just slice back, you know, basically the return of the retirement benefits that they've paid in, you know, the game doesn't stop. You yeah. need the military, you need the interest on the debt, but you don't need the boomers anymore because they're at retirement age. Gotcha, gotcha. So, Those are the politics. Okay, so so then how does this unfold uh, going down? The, we're just going to see more of that then is what you're saying. Well, here's how it unfolds. You have three choices. You can either offset monetary inflation with labor deflation, which is the slow burn, which is, you know, whether I, I basically debase your assets or I make you work for cheaper or I make you work your entire life until you're 90, you know, you're working, (laughs) you're, you're running the, the, you know, the cash register at the local diner as opposed to you're working at McDonald's as opposed to retiring. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so what we're doing is we've been engaging in massive monetary inflation and offsetting it with labor deflation coming from globalization and the various games we're talking about. That's what I call the slow burn. So that's one option is we just keep slow burning and squeezing people and squeezing people and squeezing people. Um, The other thing we can do is we can depopulate, you know, so we accelerate the squeeze and it gets uglier. And that's usually what war is. Mm. Um, And the question is whether it's economic war as we're watching in Greece or physical war as we're watching in Libya, you know, it, it's, it's a form of, as I said, you know, what the economic warfare in, in Russia, the drop the population, think about 25 million in less than a decade. Um, then the third thing we can do, Jay, is we can shift the lines of technology. And here's the interesting thing. If you said to me, count up all the equity wealth in the world, whether it's living equity or financial equity, and, um, and, and say to yourself, okay, that number is X. We have X trillion of total equity value on planet Earth. If we just said, okay, we're, we're going to run planet Earth to optimize that equity, how much bigger could we make the equity? I would say at least 100 times or more. The wealth potential, if we ran planet Earth to optimize total you know, wealth, including, and I don't mean just financial wealth, but human wealth, mm-hmm. could be much, much greater if we integrated technology in a way that would help us do that. So if you look at the energy technology that's been held in the closet and not integrated, or if you looked at healthcare technology, which is still in the closet, I mean, the reason our healthcare expenses are off the charts is because we eat rotten food and, and, and a lot of the technology that could make it cost efficient to stay healthy or, or, you know, stop cancer, I would say it's been kept, you know, sort of in the closet and kept suppressed. Is that also an so example of, deep, of, 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 of depopulation policy there? Well, I think I think it's a I think it's a um, a function of control. In other words, if a very few people are going to control the many, then um, you know some of these technologies are highly decentralizing. And one of the problems you have in terms of governance is how do you bring them out of the closet without having wild increases in population or sort of an out of control situation where you and your team may not control any longer. And I think if you if you look at what's happening in the planet, there there are two things going on. One is we're watching a fundamental reengineering of how the governance systems work because the people running things are thinking, okay, 
you know, new technology is coming out of the closet. How do I re-engineer the governance system so I can let that happen in a way that it's not decentralizing? So that's number one. But then number two, I think the other fear,